that's really interesting. The fact that, yeah. you know, most of us in, you know, especially here, we don't, it's like we kind of ignore our intuition. It's like we we go along with what, what our mind might tell, tell us or what right. people are telling us. Like, like, for example, like say, say like, you know, like say if you were going, you, you know, you want, if you have a, if you want to like study like a subject in college that you, that you feel passionate right. about, but then you get dissuaded, you know, to, because they said, because someone tell you, oh, it's not going to help you make money or whatever. Right. And then they end up going down that route. How can we uh, cultivate that intuition to know, to like, to guide us in our lives, you know, every day? I think there's a, a multitude of ways. I think the first way is working on becoming more self-aware. So in teaching self-awareness, I call it a habitude because it's a habit, but it's a mindset. And it's your ability to see inside and outside of yourself simultaneously. To see how not only you're interacting with the world, how you're coming to it, how you're engaging with it, but what other perceptions are of that. Like when we it, it, when you look at personal branding, your brand isn't only what you say about yourself. Your brand is being brave enough to understand what people say about you when you leave the room. And to, to look at both of those pieces of information honestly and equally. And so I think the first step in the pathway to purpose is self-awareness, is understanding who you are and understanding that your genius is not an anomaly. It's not something that is, is Birth, you know, is given out at birth to other people. Your genius is your birthright. It is your the part of your life that makes you not only come alive, but it's the part of your life that fuels your resiliency to stay alive when things are um, knocking you down. So being in touch with that, being in touch with the parts of what you do and how you do it that change who you're becoming and being attuned to that. And in the study of genius leaders and genius organizations over the last two decades that I've engaged in. That that intuition, that knowing that this is something different, like whether it's when I play the piano or for me it's when I speak or for some it's when they draw or others when they dance. That feeling, that intuitive feeling was present and we were and, and leaders speak about being aware of it as early as three years old, four years old, five years old. And then you go to school and that doesn't fit into the curriculum or that doesn't fit into someone else's plans for you. So you start hiding and holding in those moments. You start sort of planning around those moments. Steve Jobs has an amazing video. It's a really old video. And he talked about the moment his world changed. And he said, you know, we're taught, and this is important, we're taught to believe this from our parents, from our society, from our schools. We're taught to believe that the world is what it is. And your job is to exist in that world, to fit in into that world, to try not to knock down so many things in your pathway, what in, you envision is forward in that world. And that is absolutely not true. When you look around and you understand that that world was created by people that were no smarter than you, no better than you, no wiser than you, no more genius than you, and that you have a chance to create what you don't see in that world. You have a chance to change that world. From that moment, that realization, everything in the world changes because your perception of the world and yourself in it changes. So I think that's the first step. I think the second step speaks to the importance of what Dale Carnegie said, you, you are the five people you hang around most. So the people that you choose to associate with, align with, learn with, lead with, be a part of a community with, should be very careful selections because there are people that enhance your life in different ways. But if you're really going to grow your potential, the people that you surround yourself with should be very, very importantly and consciously selected. We call it a dream team in Choose to Matter. Surrounding yourself with people that have different assets than you, different ideas than you, different backgrounds than you, different experiences. And in that, you can stand on their shoulders. You see further when you stand on the shoulders of giants. And um, helping, helping people find the right network is really important because it is your network of people that are different than you that have the ability to make you become a better version of you, not just the people that are like you. 
So being around disruptors, being around change makers, being around visionaries, being around people in different fields that have disrupted but have the same mindset as Steve Jobs, that they were born to make an impact and they're going to do exactly that. That's how I've gained confidence. That's how I've gained um, fierceness and courage and the ability to do the best version of what I do. And then I think the third thing is, is action, doing it, not talking about it, not dreaming about it, not saying one day when I'm done with this regular stuff that I'm supposed to do, like an extracurricular activity, I'll pursue my passion or I'll discover my purpose. That's why we say mattering is the agenda. And so you can reach levels of success, but you're not gonna reach the place where we seek to reach and that's significant, where you know that your life matters and you know it mattered to people because you're living it the fullest. And so you commit to that. You take actions toward that. You don't think about it, you do it, and then you reflect on it. I think those three things, being self-aware, having a very carefully chosen network of diverse influences, and third, taking action, doing things and discovering what you're capable of, doing things you're terrified of doing, and discovering that even if you sucked at doing it, you still did it, which is more than 99% of the world can say that they did. I'm scared every day. I am failing every day. I screw up every day, but I still do it. And I just get better at getting up <laughs> from falling down. I can do it quick now. <laughs> oh, wow. Awesome. That's, that's, that is, uh, I'm, I'm speechless right now because you just, <laughs> you just, uh, you just, uh, you just brought a great message there in those, in those, in those answers there. It's, it's really great. Uh, perfect i mean it's i mean it's really true though and i mean it's like right now especially like you know like right now with social media it's like we we have the opportunity to impact the world even more now and and so i got let me transition this let me transition to this here how important is social media and and uh, why do you think uh organ organizations or businesses should be using social media so I think social media's intention, like I share with students, I share with people that I, I teach, um, the internet wasn't created to give you more access to cat videos. <laughs> the internet was created to advance humanity. And so if you understand how to use social media with the purpose of advancing humanity, or if you make it more concrete to our movement, you advance our ability to matter to ourselves, to one another, then social media is the greatest amplifier, the greatest opportunity, the greatest disruptor in human history. If we choose to be brave with it, if we choose to be human with it, if we choose to use it in our vulnerability and not just in our verbosity. So um, that's that's what um, we, we partner with social media platforms, we partner with communities that advance our objective um, when we're face to face with each other. But if we can't do what we are doing on social media face to face, or if it looks different or feels different than face to face, then we should not be using social media. So meeting you in Houston would have been fantastic, but it would not be any different than we're meeting right now. I would be looking at you, I would be talking to you, I'm not doing a super job of listening to you. I'm doing more talking than listening. But I think it's like a great, an absolute great honor to not just have, and, and what amplifies the honor of talking to you, the honor from learning from you, the honor from being able to share insights with you, is that we have other people that are joining the conversation. I don't know if anybody's joining it right now, but they might later. And then we have the ability to expand our room. And so that's the greatest ability. People think social media's gift is giving us access to information. Its gift is giving us access to humanity, the best of humanity. And by surrounding ourselves with the best of humanity, it, it commissions us to, to be a better version of ourselves in that space because it, it, it makes me better every day. I read you know, commentary like social media makes us stupider. Reading somebody, one of my friends, 
uh, wrote today that reading inspirational quotes makes you dumber or whatever. But I ask you, do you sit down and at a table when you're with somebody, read inspirational quotes to them? No. But there's a lot of things that you said today that are inspirational that I could write down and share. So if you look and peel back the layers of the mask that we hide behind in social media and we use it to amplify human behavior, human intention, human needs and desires, like needing to be needing to know we matter, then it is the greatest gift to learning, it's the greatest gift to leading, and it is absolutely responsible for a movement that began in a small room with a few thousand people in Des Moines, Iowa, to reach millions of people, to impact millions of people. Because when we, when we come together in a human way, around a human message, we see the best of humanity. And Truth to Matter is, is the best of any example that I've seen in humanity across generations. In the people leading the movement, the fierce, we have about a million kids in the movement, and the fiercest leaders of the message of the agenda are seven to 11 year olds. And they just happen to be girls. I'm not really sure why, but seven to 11 year old girls that are almost solely responsible for Choose to Matter being what it is today. And wow. um, yeah, so I, I get to share that. I get to share their story. I get to share genius. I get to share the best examples of what I see face to face with people. And that gets to spread. I'll give you a very small life saving example. There was a teacher, a classroom teacher in um, Colorado Springs, Colorado. And like many classroom teachers, got a phone call that no teacher, no parent wants to get that one of her students attempted, made an attempt on her life. This is one of the best and brightest students in the school. That is one of the most common calls I get from schools and organizations. Because there's not been one suicide, there's been a rash of suicides. Because people want to matter more than they want to live, especially young people. And so as she could not go to the hospital because the young lady had a 48 hour watch, she said, can I write her a letter? So she wrote her a letter with very specific language telling her explicitly how she mattered, why she mattered, and how the world would be less than if she did not recover and come back to school. And the young girl's response is really important because this was a girl that had all the accolades. This was not a struggling student. This was a superstar athlete. And everyone assumed that this girl thought she mattered, knew she mattered. Everybody wanted to be this girl. And the young girl wrote a letter back to Brittany and said, I am so shocked at your letter. I did not think anybody missed me. I did not think anybody would care that I did not exist. And I didn't think anybody would be any less than if I wasn't alive. So that wow. night, Brittany went home and wrote 175 mattergrams, is what they are, mattergrams to each and every one of her 175 students. Now that's a beautiful story. And 175 lives were touched forever and very likely saved. But because of social media, I have been able to share that story. I've been able to share that small act of mattering and not taking for granted or assuming that people know they do. And now I think the blog post I wrote on it has been shared 100,000 times on so many different platforms. And we have thousands, if not millions of teachers writing letters to their students, parents writing letters to their kids, employees writing letters to their employees, so that that moment would not happen. That is the power of social media. To advance even in the worst of our times, in the darkest of times, the best of our humanity. That is why I love being alive. That is a wild moment for me. Nice. That's really nice. <laughs> and and just to and just to let you know, you know, I don't mind you chatting because that's that's the that's the main purpose of my show anyway. Because what well, I mean, I mean, because the fact of the matter is, I'm an introvert, and I, I mean, it's like being in front of the camera. It's not my thing, but you know, but just because of seeing the need to be in front of the camera yeah. to share messages. This is that's why I'm doing this, and of course, especially interviewing people, 
like you, it it makes it easier for me, and I'm and I'm fine with that. So so don't so you don't have to apologize for saying that you're chatting a lot. So I'm, I'm fine with it. You know that's <laughs> that's why that's why. Yeah, no, that's why that's why. You're modeling bravery. Like that clip right there, I'm going to show to students. That's going to impact thousands of students. More importantly, it's going to impact their teachers because kids are not the ones that are scared to share their story, that are worried about putting their ideas out there, worried about asking questions. Even if the people that answer them, they can't answer the question in a way that you might have perceived. That's bravery. That's courage embodied. I want to surround students with examples of brave leaders and brave learners like you that say, this is not my comfort zone. This may not even be my genius. This may not even be what I like doing, but it is needed by my community. And so I'm willing to step up. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to take a risk. I'm willing to get better. I'm willing to, to do this and be vulnerable because it's needed. So in your description of what you were doing, you said the word need two times. And that is the deepest driver of human behavior. To know that our actions are count, our actions count, but to know that they're being counted on, to know that somebody's going to listen, is is an honor. We don't deserve. I mean, I think that we've been brought up in a system where we think we can demand, we think we deserve by our mere presence somebody's attention, rather than looking at attention as a gift, and that every day you earn it. And every second you earn of somebody's attention is an absolute gift that you are not going to mess up. And so you're going to keep trying because they gave you the gift of their attention. They gave you the gift of their vulnerability. They gave you the gift of their bravery and tried something or shared something or did something because you took the first step in front of them. They have a chance to do that every single day. And that's why I put so much raw stuff out there unedited <laughs> my brain unedited because i want other people to get to chance you know i don't have a lot of produced stuff out there because i want people to be absolutely fully and fiercely who they are not who they think they should be or not who they prep to be for this event or that event even in my events even in my large stadium level speeches this is who you get it is the same talking to me when I'm talking to one person, if I'm talking to a stadium of 25,000 people. It is me. That is it. And I am who I am. And I'm, I'm grateful that I have people's attention. And if I don't, I should learn from that. And that's on me. That's not on them. That's on me. Hmm. Wow. That's really interesting. <laughs> there. So, so of course, uh, I mean,